<clears throat> well, Immunovia is certainly an uh, immune oncology company, but we do not use the immune system to uh, treat the drug therapy. Uh, we do um, use the immune system to uh, detect disease early, to detect cancer early, because finding the cancer early is actually the, the best way to, to, uh, to improve the care. So uh, the company is, um, is uh, founded on the ability to measure what goes on in the immune system, because the immune system is the first to, to react when you do catch a disease such as cancer or autoimmunity. Uh, and what we have is the ability to measure many proteins at the same time, proteins that are part of or related to the immune system, to the immune response to disease. So when the disease is detected by the immune system in the body, we can measure a change in the immune system and find that, that signal from the immune system itself, which is a way to find it very, very early. And we do that by measuring many proteins at the same time, finding a fingerprint in the, in the pattern of proteins, uh, meaning that uh, uh, you have all of you some 20,000 different proteins circulating in your blood and many of these are related to the immune system or part of the immune system. And it has a certain pattern relative concentration of the proteins when you're healthy and when you catch a disease somewhere in that landscape of proteins there is a change like a fingerprint. Uh, and that is the one we can detect with our technology. So um, how do we do this? Well, to measure proteins, one needs something called antibodies. Antibodies are molecules that uh, bind, that catch uh, uh, proteins very specifically. Only one type of protein is ca caught by one type of one uh, antibody. And we have an, have a, have an asset uh, uh, when it comes to the antibodies because this is a library of antibodies developed specifically to, to uh, <coughs> be stable on, on this plastic surface. And this has been a problem to create this type of platforms in history. But now we have one that is extremely stable over time, thanks to the work done by, by uh, Professor Carl Barbeck and his team at Lund University. So this is a unique feature for our technology called the Imbray platform, that we have antibodies that, that can be printed on the surface. <coughs> and we can print many of them, up to 2,000 antibodies per square centimeter and measure very many proteins at the same time. So when we have produced this, uh, this uh, plastic piece with many antibodies on, we do um, use uh, standard blood samples and we do then compare uh, when we develop a new test um, uh, blood from, from the healthy and the deceased, if that's the clinical question. Uh, and uh, we do that using four to five hundred different antibodies. And then we have very advanced bioinformatics software to find out which ones in this uh, large amount of, of markers actually are needed to, to answer the question, do, does this person uh, have a disease or is he, is he healthy? So this is the whole platform. It's uh, about 16, 17 years of research in, in, in one minute here. So the assets, the antibody uh, platform, uh, antibodies, which without this wouldn't work, very uh, proprietary uh, and advanced bioinformatics to find out which ones are required for the actual product. And that normally ends up between 20 and 40 of these four or 500 that we use in, in the research mode. Then using uh, the technology, uh, commercially, it, it's a rather straightforward process uh, in, the, in the clinical laboratory. Using a standard blood sample from the patient, putting on uh, fluorescent markers to, to the proteins in the blood and then applying it to the product, <coughs> to the chip. And we can have 14 different blood samples on the same uh, slide. The slide is then read with a standard fluorescence scanner and creating a picture. That picture is uploaded to uh, Immunovia service and in servers and interpreted with our uh, uh, software, uh, creating, uh, in, in this case that we're going to talk about today, a uh, yes, no, uh, do you have cancer or do you not, in terms of pancreatic cancer, which is our first product going to market. So it doesn't require any new instrumentation that's not already on the market, uh, but it does require, of course, our uh, chip with antibodies on and our um, um, interpretation software. So our first product is to detect pancreatic cancer early. And the reason we did choose this, this uh, disease was obviously we had good results, but also it's, 
in, in a very large clinical need. There is nothing out there to find pancreatic cancer early. And today's situation is that it's actually the third most common uh, cancer in terms of mortality. How many people actually die in absolute number per year? It did pass breast cancer a couple of years ago in US specifically. So it's number three when it comes to number of people dying. These are the US figures from 2016. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not the most common cancer, but it's number three in terms of mortality and it's moving up, whereas uh, the, the mortality in other cancers are decreasing. So the five year survival is very low. It's five to eight percent dependent on country. And this is due to that the cancer in, in the pancreas is detected late uh, since there are no or very vague symptoms in the early stages when it's treatable. So most people are actually found when, when the cancer is not treatable anymore. However, if it could be found in stage one, the first stage of cancer, you could get an, an survival with current uh, treatment, which is surgery. Um, in, uh, in, of 50, up to 50 percent instead of 5 to 80 percent. So early detection is very important and that's the reason we we, we are gone for, for this uh, application first. So looking at the different stages of this cancer, as I said, the difference of being found in, in the later stages is, is, is uh, for going from 5 to 50 percent survival chance if it could be found here. However, today uh, about 80% of people who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer are unfortunately in a non-treatable stage and the medium survival in Europe is 4.6 months after diagnosis. So the only hope really in, in this cancer is, is uh, early detection. Uh, so that has an incredible impact on the, on the outcome whether you can find it in this stage or, or late. So we have done very large retrospective studies on biobanks containing blood samples from people with cancer and healthy and so forth. And we have shown in thousands of patients that we can find the stage one and two uh, cancers uh, with about 96% accuracy. And this is just to <coughs> illustrate that the red ones are the cancer people people with cancer and, and blue ones with, we are, are healthy. And, and our technology can distinguish between these ones uh, and telling who has the cancer and who has not. Um, going to market now with this, this, this test. Um, the cancer is not so common that you can screen or test everybody uh, once a year or so forth. That is not possible to defend from a health economic point of view. But there are certain groups that have higher risk than others to acquire the cancer and, and these uh, ones are, are <coughs> our target. Today when you do get late symptoms the tools that are available for the clinicians are imaging endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, this is the invasive version you go down in the body. Not very pleasant but it's uh, a tool used and it's magnet uh, uh, MRI. Uh, it's uh, uh, CT uh, um, and it's endosco endo endoscopy or these ones in combination and so the results today is about 80-85% cannot be treated. Our goal is to make sure that people come much earlier to, uh, to the current uh, tree uh, of, of treatment. Not to change the practice but to make sure that people come much earlier here because the surgeons need to know where to cut anyway. Uh, for imaging. So the risk groups we are looking at is, is the ones that have uh, a familiar or hereditary uh, uh, higher risk, meaning that you have uh, close relatives that have died of pancreatic cancer. If you have several ones uh, of your close relatives that have had pancreatic cancer, two, three, your risk may be up to 30 times higher than normal. Not 30 percent, 30 times. So this is a very, um, uh, of course, obvious group and the people are very aware because their close relatives have, have died and they know that they are in the risk zone themselves. This is about 200,000 patients in Europe and US. Uh, they need testing twice a year with a blood sample uh, from say 45 and, and lifelong. So that's a very interesting group for us because they are very aware of, of the disease. Okay. Then in the total of people getting pancreatic cancer, 90% uh, are not hereditary, so 90 are sporadic, 10% are approximately coming from the hereditary group. So how to address the big chunk, the, the 90%? Well, one uh, uh, trigger is actually that it has been found in the last, last years, in the last five, six years, it's been very 
large uh, investigations that um, if you are over 50 and you get your first diagnosis of diabetes, then you have an eight to, to tenfold increased risk that it's actually pancreatic cancer. Close to 1% of the over 50 uh, with first diagnosis of diabetes actually get pancreatic cancer within three years after the diabetes diagnosis. So it's definitely a, a group worth checking up. These ones do not need to be uh, uh, monitored lifelong, but only for three years. Because if, it hasn't, uh, if you haven't developed cancer after three years, it, it's uh, normal type 2 diabetes. So, but it's a big group. It's three million, more than three million new people every year in Europe and US that, that do get uh, diabetes after 50 for the first time. So, so that's a very large group uh, and very interesting for us, of course, to, to utilize. Then there's a third uh, clinical use of it, and that is that people actually do often have vague symptoms in the early stages as well. But when you come to, and they do visit uh, primary care, Vortrantral and these ones, uh, the, the problem is that these symptoms are very general. It means indigestion, mid-back pain, um, pain on eating, fatigue, it can be anything really. So the primary care sends them off to specialists in the hospital, but for other suspicions. Then, of course, the ones who actually have cancer, they don't find that disease. So they come back after a while to the primary care and go back and forth. And the Brits have investigated this very, very carefully, how it works in the, in the health care. And there can be up to 18 uh, visits to a doctor before you get the right diagnosis for the one who actually have cancer. This takes at least six to nine months in average. The problem is that in six to nine months, you can move from treatable to non-treatable for the ones who actually have cancer. So there are large efforts going on in Scandinavia, UK and US predominantly to decrease this time radically by using, um, giving the tools to the primary care to, to, to risk, increase the number of people who actually should get diagnosed much earlier and send them to something called diagnostic centers. These centers absolutely need a blood test because they can't do imaging on everyone who comes there. So we work with some, some large institutes in UK and, and, and other places using our tests uh, uh, for that purpose as well. So uh, that's, that's the market we are going for. How to get there is, is very important to win the key pin leaders. These are the most important uh, pancreologists or people specialists uh, on, on the pancreas cancer in the world. So we have built a key opinion leader network working with us of predominantly uh, the ones that have an influence on national guidelines. Uh, national guidelines is, is to set the standards for a country how to handle a certain disease. So we work, for example, uh, uh, with um, the US woman called Margaret Tempera had, headed, uh, heading the U, uh, San Francisco gastro uh, part, but she's the chairman of the US a committee that sets the guidelines for pancreatic cancers. That's one of our key opinion leaders. That's the type of, of network we have built up there. And why do we need them? First of all, they are the first customers themselves. Secondly, they do influence all other, um, all other uh, potential buyers in, in, the in the health community. Even more important, they are actually advisors to the payers, the um, insurance systems and insurance companies that pay uh, uh, for, for the test later on or takes decision. They're also involved with the patient organizations. So if you don't have the key opinion leaders with you, everything else falls apart. So this is extremely important in, in the market uh, access program. All right, so we also do something called prospective studies, and that is to use the uh, test as it's supposed to be used in these three different risk groups I talked about. And prospective studies in diagnostics is very different from what the other guys will talk about in therapeutics. Predominantly, the uh, prospective studies in diagnosis is done to give material for uh, documentation and, and usage uh, uh, for, of the test uh, so that the insurance companies will take the decisions to pay for it. It's not to get the right to sell, because that you do get on, on, on the retrospective material and other documentation. So it's a different process for diagnostics, which is simpler than for, for pharma, but it's still important with prospective studies using it as it's supposed to be used, and that is to get paid. So we run three large uh, retrospective studies, one for this first familiar group, and there we are done, running a multi-center study ongoing with centers in US, uh, United Kingdom, Spain, and Sweden. Uh, Saul Grinska is, is involved in Sweden. 
and several centers in US. And so this is um, a multi-center study with many centers involved because uh, each center has a limited number of familiar people they meet anyway regularly every year. So we tap onto the ongoing program to get the recruitment easier to the program. So, so that's one study important for us and we expect to have an interim readout of this one during uh, next year, early next year. Then we have the new onset diabetics. This is the big one. Um, and here we have recently a press release that we are starting actually the world's largest study in this area prospectively uh, with the support of the Swedish state in form of Swe Life and uh, Region Skåne and Region Uppsala will provide uh, 6,000 patients uh, to this study for us. Very good. We have also uh, a letter of intent with Denmark through an organization called DD2, which is funded largely by Novo Nordisk, that they will add another 3,500 patients. So we will have close to 10,000 patients only in Scandinavia, and that is what's needed for that study. We are also working to add a, a US part of that one because of market reasons. Uh, for this last one, the uh, vague symptoms or early symptoms, we have a pilot study started at uh, University College London, which is um, running a pilot for, for the health authorities in the UK, covering about 6 million people in northern London uh, and 800 primary care stations where we get the patients from for that one. So all these ones will provide results that we will use to finally get um, uh, payment from, from the insurance organizations. That's the purpose of this. So how big is the market? Well, looking at these three groups, the hereditary risk group is um, uh, uh, 200,000 patients, two tests per year. We do predict about 500 euros per test, and that will mean a, a market of 200 million euro, 2 billion Swedish for this group. Uh, the, the high risk group of diabetics, uh, uh, 3, under 3 million new patients every year. If we calculate low with one test per patient per, per two, two years, ideally it should be two tests per year for three years, but let's, let's be conservative. It's still a market potential of, of 3 uh, billion euros. Uh, and the high early symptoms group, approximately 1 million tests per year used needed in Europe and US. Uh, and that would be a half a billion euro. A very, very important and, and large market we are addressing here at full penetration. So where are we? Well, uh, we have done the retrospective studies. We are finishing these ones. We are working with lots with the formal accreditations of various kinds for US and Europe. Uh, and when this is uh, um, achieved at the end of this year, we will start what we call self-pay uh, sales, selling to people and organizations that pay uh, without reimbursement, without uh, insurance pay. And that is, is what, we, uh, what we're going for at the end of this year. In the meantime, we are doing the prospective studies leading to, uh, to reimburse sales uh, at the end of 2020 approximately. So our um, guidance is that we uh, uh, have a goal to reach a turnover at the end of the self-pay period of 250 to 300 million Swedish. And uh, two years after the reimbursement decision, uh, we are predicting that we will be able to reach somewhere in 800 to 1 billion Swedish crowns in, in turnover. That's our guidelines that we have released. Finally, a few words about the pipeline as well. As you see, this technology is general in the sense that we measure the immune response to disease. So we have some very interesting early results in, in autoimmunity. And autoimmunity is a disease is where the immune system itself is, is attacking the, the body. And there are actually over 100 different types of autoimmune disorders, but there are some generic uh, needs in, the in, the, in healthcare. The first one, number one here, is that get the correct diagnosis early. It's very difficult uh, for certain situations for the clinicians, rheumatologists, to set the right diagnosis because the symptoms are overlapping between the diseases. So there can be a long time between onset of, of disease and, and actually the correct diagnosis. If you have the wrong diagnosis, you get the wrong treatment, which is not good. So that's an area we are important for us. We are also looking at number three here, and that is that most of these ones do, it's a chronic disease. You don't, you have it your whole life once you got it, but it goes and comes. Sometimes it's, it's inactive and sometimes it gets active, called flares, skov in Swedish. Uh, and monitoring when and predicting when a flare will happen is, is really important for, uh, for the clinicians. So that's where we are. So 
It's a, why do we do it? It's a large volume market. Total uh, uh, market is three and a half billion US. You can split it in two different parts where we focus on what's called systemic, uh, where these diseases uh, fit in, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, lupus. And that market is four and a half billion. We go for, for this one. So we have great results at the first studies. Uh, uh, selecting SLE patients out of a mix of the rest ones with 96% accuracy and, and then you can of course pick the other ones as well. So this is forms our basis. We are doing complementary and additional retrospective studies this year. We have got big biobanks in the house from, from Linköping University Hospital and we will get results during the year that will determine our final product strategy in this area. So finally, focus on getting the pancreas cancer test to market this year, end of this year by fi finishing the accreditation and the regulatory and production scale and then expand the autoimmunity program. And our end goal is always getting paid for reimbursement and become the national guideline globally for pancreatic cancer. Thank you. Thank you yeah. much. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, like you said, going towards the market uh, and Reimbursement is key. Yes. Uh, what would you say is the, the main challenge that you're facing as to that aspect? To that aspect. Well, um, reimbursement systems, I mean, payer systems are different per country. You know, US, you have, have a situation where the um, uh, federal, the state systems, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, cover about 50 to 60 percent of the population. Then you have have a number of large private insurance companies, but in total it's actually around almost a hundred different insurance companies. And mm -hmm. you have to, to have a good strategy who you uh, convince in which order and things like that, and, and use local advisors with, with long, strong influence. Uh, when it comes to Europe, you cannot, you, you get the permission to sell in Europe uh, centrally through a mark and, and uh, accreditations according to ISO standards. So that is straightforward, mm -hmm. although it's a lot of work, but it's straightforward. Mm -hmm. But to get paid is different per country and in certain countries is different per region, not to mention Sweden where the decisions are somewhere in, in these 21 mm. different lunch things and so forth. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, you have to have a strategy per country basically and you have mm. to have local knowledge where you get in. Yeah, and uh, this is a process that will take some time. What are the alternatives? Uh, I mean, so if, if a patient really wants yes. this? That's why we start self-pay and, and uh, uh, you can, as soon as you have the accreditations, you're allowed to, to in, in, in diagnostics to, to deliver the test uh, result based on, on people or health organizations paying out of their current budgets. And mm. it, the rule of thumb is that you can reach approximately 5% of the US market in that way, which is significant. And that's what we introduce. And it's starting to get uh, possible uh, through various channels in, in, in Europe as well, most European countries. So that's what we are going to do first and what everybody in diagnostics does, of course, uh, go in this way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had a busy 2017. Yes. Um, it will probably be a busy 2018 as well. Even more so. What, what are you personally looking forward to the most this year? Sales start. Sales start. Sales start. First invoice paid. <laughs> <laughs> Not sent, but paid. Paid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Much uh, better than uh, sent. I'm going to turn to the audience to see if anyone here has a question. It's okay to to post a question in Swedish, and we can translate it. Any competitive actions? Right. Um, well, uh, when we started this uh, and decided strategically to go for pancreatic cancer, uh, we were way ahead of most most others, and we still are ahead. But uh, the, in the meantime, pancreatic cancer has risen to the surface, to put it nicely, because for several reasons. The US uh, even put a law in place that the National Cancer Institute of this has to focus on pancreatic cancer. So the academic money for pancreatic cancer has increased tremendously, meaning that there are many publications coming out. But these are all in the early stages. Yeah. So, so there are many interesting approaches, but they are very early stage there. Then there is a, a, a general interest in early detection and many large initiatives on the commercial side and investments specifically in the US. And they all use, I mean, the obvious example, uh, the biggest challenge is pancreatic cancer because it's the worst situation. So many large companies or large, not large companies maybe, but the large, largely funded new companies are focusing on this or at least saying they are. 
Uh, we still uh, are pretty confident that we are ahead, both time-wise and, and definitely on the result side, the accuracy. But it is a race, so uh, and there's no reason to stand still. That's clear. I think we have time for one more I'm question. I'm curious, uh, do you use the same MURA chip for autoimmune disease as for the cancer? Yeah. We, we do, um, as I said, when we do discovery work, the first studies of a new, new thing, uh, we use about four, between four and five hundred different antibodies. And most of them are actually the same between different diseases because they measure the response from the immune system. But we do add always some specific ones that are more related. For pancreatic cancer, there are certain uh, markers that are related to cancer. So we add these ones as well where we do that. So we do some some modifications, but uh, the 90% or something is the same because it's the immune response. So in that sense, it's a very efficient uh, process, both in the discovery mode and, and of course in the production mode, because the pancreatic case is not only bringing a test to market, it's also building the whole infrastructure for bringing out tests on this platform, you know? Because a new test will be the same, in, except there will be other antibodies on the, on the final chip. So the platform is, is uh, in that sense, extremely scalable. If that answers your questions, and a little bit more. more or less. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Mats, you will be grilled uh, by a Biosox analyst in a few moments uh, in a separate interview. Yeah. Uh, we thank you so much for coming today with a warm applause. Thanks, you.